uh, with this brief introduction, uh, may I request Dr. Deep Dutta to proceed with his presentation. A big thanks to Bengal Diabetes Foundation. A big thanks to you, Dr. Bipul, for introducing me. I have been closely following you since my preparing for DM entrance. And when I had come down to Guwahati, I had very fond memories of interacting with you. It's great to have Dr. Rajan also here. He comes from, he has done his DM training from JIPMA, uh, my alma mater from where I did my MBBS. I have fond memories. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bishash and the entire organizing team for putting together such a wonderful scientific program with such clinically relevant topics. In the next 15 to 20 minutes, I have been given the difficult job of to highlight the role of C-peptide in managing diabetes, a very important topic. And I did a read a lot in the past one week and I learned a lot of important things. Uh, let me share with you and uh, please feel free to ask any uh, questions. So C-peptides, you all know, I'm not going to the, in the physiology of C-peptide. We know it is secreted in equimolar amounts from the beta cells in the pancreas. The largely we used to think, at least I used to think that it is a vestigial molecule. It had no role, but I learned in the last 48 to 72 hours that there are a lot of physiological roles even attributed to C-peptide. C-peptide administration in animal models and also in human studies have shown to have a beneficial impact on renal function in terms of reducing intragromular hypertension and, and reducing renal fibrosis. It has some role in neural regeneration also and improving the ischemic preconditioning of the heart and overall improving the endothelial dysfunction. So, but it has not yet come in routine clinical practice. A lot of interesting research work is happening. If I, I did a search on PubMed with the, key, uh, with the keyword C-peptide and I got nearly uh, 3000 odd articles published in the last 20 years. So a lot of active work is happening. A, sum, a big summary, a bit summary of how C-peptide administration is known to improve the main, one of the main pathophysiology of diabetes itself in terms of reducing the endothelial dysfunction and reducing oxidative stress, which is believed to have some beneficial impact in different organ systems. In today's talk, I shall be primarily focusing not on the basic science, but on the clinical aspect, how a C-peptide assay is going to help us in our routine clinical practice. So I would like to start by stating that C-peptide is perhaps one of the most underutilized perhaps, but a very important test in the management of diabetes. Now in modern day of package medicine testing, now we have the basket medicine patients uh, come to us with the reports, with a 20 page, 30 page report. They'll have reports of molybdenum levels to co copper levels and cobalt levels, God knows what. And we have a hard time pulling our head to explain if any of them is out of range. I wish they were at least doing C-peptide in people living with diabetes. We would get so much more use useful information. So I think uh, we as clinicians should strongly discourage the balance overuse of testing. A lot of resources are wasting, uh, wasted in generating so much of data which are practically meaningless. So I think in endocrinology, it's very important not to order tests without the clinical perspective or we'll end up generating lab errors or labomas and we would always keep on barking up the wrong tree. Keep testing to minimum and keep testing to as judicious as possible. So when we talk of C-peptide assay, I think we must remember that C-peptide has a half-life. When we talk of it's being secreted along with insulin, unlike insulin, the half-life of C-peptide is nearly four to five times more. So it's a more stable molecule that way. And it is excreted primarily through the kidneys. So when we talk of C-peptide assays, there are two ways of doing it. The traditional way of is to check the C-peptide in the blood. A lot of recent data have come up is to measure the C-peptide in the urine sample. Now, how do we go about measuring C-peptide in urine? You can either do a cumbersome 24-hour urine C-peptide, which is no longer recommended nowadays. Now, I think a spot urine C-peptide or spot urine C-peptide creatinine ratio, which is adjusting for the creatinine levels of the GFR, is a much better and a robust way of assessing C-peptide levels. It is not a popular test in India, but it is very popular in UK as well as in USA. 
An important point I would like to highlight here that the C peptide assay which we are using in India, which is commercially available, is the chemiluminescence, and they are the normal C peptide assays. They are not high sensitive C peptide assays. So normal C peptide assays uh, pick up C peptide levels more than 0.2 nanomoles, nanomoles per liter or 0.6 nanograms per ml, and they cannot pick up values less than that, which typically comes as a report of less than 0.6 nanogram per ml. But the high sensitive C peptide assays is available in the West world which can pick up even lower C peptide levels and these studies have shown that gone are the concepts of absolute beta cell loss C peptide levels have been picked up even in people living with type 1 diabetes as much as 10 to 15 or 20 years after the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes and on insulin therapy similarly in type 2 diabetes also we have picked up C peptide levels even 20 to 25 years after type 2 diabetes. So in 21st century, when we talk of beta cell pliability, alpha beta switch, the concept of diabetes reversal, a lot of credit should go to the high sensitive, the ultra sensitive C peptide assays, uh, which I hope, I'm hopeful will be available in the near future for clinical use in our practice, but we don't have as of now. As with any assay, we should know the limitations. Why can we get false reports? When we are talk of C-peptide assay, if you are seeing an abnormally high report, I think we should think of cross-reactivity with anti-insulin antibodies. So any patients on chronic insulin therapy, they may have anti-insulin antibodies. Any patient, some patients can have de novo high titers of anti-insulin antibodies. So if you have an abnormally high or unexpectedly low C-peptide values, cross-check, always think of assay interference. That is one thing which has to be kept in mind. With any hormonal assay, I think it is not only the analytical issues which you have discussed, a lot of pre-analytical issues of how we go about collecting the sample that's important. C-peptide, we must realize it's a, we are trying, to, when we use this assay, we are trying to assess the beta cell function. So we want to miss, we don't want to miss patients who are having C-peptide levels in their blood, but we are missing it. That's why if you are not handling the sample correctly, it's a good clinical practice to maintain cold chain. So that will help in maintaining this level of C-peptide in the blood because ultimately at the end of the day, it's a peptide. So there are studies to show that if you collect in EDTA prepared tubes, even in room temperature, you can keep the sample for up till 24 hours before assay. Now, if you're doing an urine C-peptide assay, which I've never done personally, I've done only blood samples, it is recommended that you collect the sample in a boric acid containing tube, which will help it keeping it stable for a longer period of time. So if you're doing the assay in your own department, in your own lab, not issue. If, uh, if, your, if your center is having a collection center where the sample, sample is going to be transported to another lab, please keep this in mind. Please maintain the cold chain or you'll be falsely missing the patient you're having falsely low C peptide levels, but the patient actually would have had a much higher C peptide levels. These are points which have to be kept in mind. So why we are talking of C peptide test simply because we know in people who have lost their beta cell functions largely, then they'll have a very low C peptide assay, maybe undetectable by the conventional assays which we are using. So that is typically seen in type one diabetes or even in latent onset autoimmune diabetes of adults. In type 2 diabetes, we expect the C-peptide level to be normal to even high, especially if the patient has severe metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, the C-peptide will be high also. In people with MODI, they may look like type 1 diabetes phenotypically, but their C-peptide may be actually good. But in the clinical practice, we are sitting in an OPD, the patient walks into us, it's not easy. The patient doesn't have it written on their forehead that it's type 1 or type 2 or LADA or MODI. So there comes the role. In clinical practice, it's all about overlap of clinical features. Life is not black and white. It's mostly gray in our day-to-day -day lives. So how is the C-peptide assay going to help us in our day-to-day -day practice? It helps us in deciding when to start insulin in type 2 diabetes, right? So you want to see a residual beta cell function. A C-peptide assay is going to really help us tell the patient, yes, sorry, sir. The no point of adding more pill burden to your treatment regimen. If you start insulin, your life is going to be so much better. Also, in a prick-phobic and insulin-phobic society, a C-peptide assay greatly helps us in convincing our patients for insulin therapy. We can tell the patient, see, sir, your C-peptide levels are low. So there's no point of beating your already half-dead pancreas. It's time you start insulin. There's a lot of data to show that early intensive insulin therapy can even reverse to some degree the beta cell function. 
it helps in sometimes you may have lean type 2 diabetes and you sometimes you may have an obese type 1 diabetes right so we are really not sure what are we dealing with in our clinical practice when the patient comes to us for the first time it really helps us in differentiating the patients in them now fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes very uh, not I, I would say very common in west bengal and kerala these patients have a spectrum some of them patients they do well on tablets many of these patients need insulin also so how to decide to start insulin? I think C-peptide level as a greatly helps us in these patients. Also, as, as I said, it helps us in differentiating the genetic forms of maturity onset diabetes from type 1 diabetes and prevent unnecessary insulin use in people with MODI. Now, how do you go about testing the C-peptides? Whether should we do fasting or post meals? Post meals means one hour post meals or two hour post meals. Is it post meal or post glucose? A lot of confusions and queries come to our mind. So first of all, we must remember when we are trying to measure C-peptide, we want to detect a good residual beta cell function. So you want to increase the sensitivity of your test. You don't want to miss out the beta cell function, right? So you want to pick up as high C-peptide levels as possible. And we know after any food or glucose, there is a surge in insulin secretion. So we expect the C-peptide to go up. So to miss out patients, to prevent missing out patients, to increase the sensitivity of your test, to increase the negative predictive value of your test, always do a stimulated C-peptide, which is after meal or glucose. Always do one hour after meal and not two hours because one hour is the peak time of release of insulin and C-peptide compared to two hours. Now, should we use insulin or glucose? Uh, so glucose or meals, the answer is use mixed meals because we know from physiology that glucose stimulates insulin release from pancreas, the beta cell release, but certain amino acids and proteins have a much more potent effect on release of insulin from the pancreas. So a mixed meal contains glucose also, contains proteins and amino acids, which should have a more potent stimulus on the beta cell in promoting the release of insulin and C-peptide. So mixed meal, uh, stimulation one hour C peptide post meal is the best way to do C peptides. So you don't want to miss out patients having good residual beta cell function, right? Keep in mind, please don't do this test in a patient which would have an inhibitory effect of beta cell mass. So, if a patient comes with uncontrolled diabetes, please go for a reasonable diabetes control for four to six weeks and then you can go for C peptide test. If a patient is already on insulin therapy, then it's important. We know that the exogenous insulin may have an inhibitory effect on insulin release from the endogenous pancreas. So if a patient is on short-acting insulin, you may stop the morning dose, you may give the nighttime dose. But if the patient is on a bolus insulin like glargine, a good practice is to hold the previous day glargine if you are planning to do the next day morning C-peptide post-meal. If the patient receives glargine, that would have an inhibitory effect on C-peptide release. Now in the western world, they typically use Sustakel or Boost uh, mixed meal tolerance test to measure C-peptide. They do at 15 minutes, 30 minutes. I think you, can't, you do not do a, such a complicated C-peptide tolerance test. That's only to be done for study in clinical research purposes. In real life, one hour traditional mixed meal is good enough. We have published some papers. We have tried to say the the lipid profile, the insulin resistance, the systemic inflammatory profile post meals. And we try to use a high carbohydrate diet with Indian diets are typically rich in, in carbs. And we used a very simple mixed meal in our studies. We gave the patients a one packet of good day biscuits and one, one small bottle of Amul Elaichi meal. If you see the composition here, they get nearly 500 kilocalories. That's like a full breakfast meal amount of calories. And if you see, it has a good amount of sugar. It has a good amount of proteins and fat also. And we have published this. And this works really good in stimulating the beta cell function. And it is very easy to replicate because both Good Day Biscuits and Amor Elaichi milk are available. It's not mandatory to use it. You can use what traditional breakfast you are using in your whichever state you're coming from. You can do that. We have assessed, uh, similarly, we have used the same meal pattern to assess lipid dyslipidemia in the setting of hypothyroidism, and it has worked very well, the same meal pattern also. Now, a bit about ultra-sensitive C-peptide assays. You can see they can pick up levels in people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. I really hope we get it sooner in our clinical practice. So how do we implement? We don't have this, so we are doing the traditional C-peptide assays. So this is a typical flowchart if you see here. If you are suspecting, uh, you want to differentiate type 1 or type 2 or LADA in your patients, 
So this is a value of C peptide. You can do a one hour post break for C peptide. If it comes less than 0.2 nanograms nanomoles per liter or less than 0.6 nanograms per ml. So it is almost clear cut that there is virtually no residual beta cell function. I think you directly go to insulin. Anybody having a level more than two nanograms per ml, we are very, very sure that the person is having a pretty good beta cell function. And between two to one or two to uh, point two to uh, one nanomoles per liter or 0.6 to two nanograms per ml, I think that is the intermediate uh, state. If you are doing the urine C peptide to creatinine ratio, you, it is the spot urine C peptide to creatinine ratio can be done any time of the day. No fasting, no timing is important. If the value comes less than 0.2 nanomoles per millimoles, lower than that, it is, tells that virtually there is no residual beta cell function. An important point, if a patient has got CKD, this test will come falsely negative. You should not be using this test in people with GFR less than 60 ml per minute. Very important point to be kept in mind. A lot of role in C peptide. So now we talk of diabetes reversal, especially after the direct study. This is an interesting paper which was just published uh, just one day back. Yesterday only it came online. I was searching through PubMed, which showed that people who have undergone metabolic surgery or RUNY gastric bypass, some people undergo diabetes reversal, some people don't. So who are the patients who will undergo? So studies have shown that people who have a good residual beta cell function, those, those who had a C peptide level more than three nanograms per ml, they had a very, very high chance of reversal of diabetes. So even in patients who are obese, walking into a clinic, who are not motivated to control their diet and lifestyle, you can do their C peptide level. If it comes, which will almost always comes high, you can tell, sir, if you lose your body weight, you can actually reverse your diabetes. That really motivates the patient to go for a good therapeutic and diet lifestyle changes. So C peptide is not only a great test to decide whether to start insulin, when to start insulin, what type of insulin to use, but also to tell the patient about the nature of their diabetes, whether diabetes reversal would really be possible or not. So it's a great test. It's a cheap test. In commercial labs, it costs around 500 odd rupees. In your centers, it may be even cheaper also. Do it the right way, please. Please do it one hour after a mixed meal is the best way to test the C peptide. And please maintain cold chain if you're transporting the sample to some other lab to do the testing. Urine C peptide to creatinine ratio, I'm sure we'll pick up soon in the future. And I really pray we have a high sensitive C peptide assay available with us in the near future. I think with this, I'll end my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Deep Dutta. It was a very uh, nice presentation. You have covered uh, most of the aspects of C-peptide, uh, how to collect the samples, prognostic, can it be used as a prognostic marker, a diagnostic marker, uh, how to select patient based on uh, C-peptide level, whom to uh, give insulin, who will respond or who will not. So uh, we'll have uh, this question answer session uh, at the end of all these three talks. So I request my uh, co-chair, uh, to introduce uh, our second speaker uh, so that we can go ahead with the second uh, lecture.